chapter 2, beginning with verse 8, as we consider this morning, the shepherds. We're in message number 3 today in our series, The Cast of Christmas. And this morning I want to share about the shepherds and the lamb. The shepherds and the lamb. Luke's account begins there in chapter 2 in verse 8 concerning the shepherds. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Verse 15, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven. And the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the sayings which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds and the lamb. A story surfaced about a soldier in Operation Desert Storm who received a John Deere letter. His girlfriend not only dropped him, but also told him that she was marrying someone else. Adding insult to injury, she added, Please return my favorite picture of myself. I need it for my engagement photo in the newspaper. The young soldier was devastated. But a buddy, however, heard about that and and uh, he devised a plan. Other soldiers pitched in extra photos of their girlfriends. They were placed in a shoebox, and it was sent home with this note. Please find your picture and return the rest. <laughs> For the life of me, I can't remember exactly which one you were. What a difference. What a different perspective. Life was different, not only for the soldier, but certainly for the surprise girlfriend. Friend, there was a day that brought that kind of different perspective to the earth. After this day, things would never be the same. And you're thinking about the birth of Christ, and that's true. But I'm thinking about a little earlier than that. I believe what changed the perspective on the earth was the day John the Baptist stood there on the bank of the Jordan River and pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb changed the world. Luke's narrative of Christ's birth tells us that the shepherds, of course, were in the field and they were watching after their flocks. It happened at night and the angel came and the glory of God shone all around them in the nighttime. And there came the announcement, verses 10 through 12. Do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. If you go to Bethlehem today, you'll see the place where Christ was believed to have been born. Throughout history, churches have been built on the holy sites. So to get to the birthplace of Jesus, 
you enter into the church of nativity. And then you go down the stairs. And there you will see an altar about the size of a house fireplace marking the spot of the birth. If you can see past the curtains surrounding that little altar, you can see clearly that it was a rocky cave. Our picture of a stable in our day and culture is usually of wood. But in those ancient days in the Holy Land, they were made of rocky caves. Most were underneath the houses. You see, there the animals were more easily kept and cared for. It is probable that Jesus was born in a rocky cave that was called a stable. However, there is another very interesting idea. It is believed that these shepherds and these sheep were not ordinary shepherds and sheep. According to the Jewish writing, the Mishnah, the shepherds were watching the flock near a watchtower called Migdal Edar, or Edar, which lay on the outskirts of Bethlehem on the road to Jerusalem. The flocks that were brought there were used, were raised up for temple sacrifices. These shepherds would have been uniquely and specifically trained to care for these sheep. You see, while the sheep were in the fields, the ewes would be brought to the watchtower, Migdal Edar, to give birth. And they were handled according to rabbinic guidelines, wrapped in strips of cloth called swaddling cloth, And they were wrapped to give them warmth and protection. You see, the lambs for sacrifice had to be perfect, without spot or blemish. Alfred Edersham, in his work, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, comes to the conclusion that these flocks were destined to temple sacrifices. Edersham even goes a step further to suggest that the watchtower was the actual place of Christ's birth. It is interesting that when the angels announced Christ's birth to the shepherds, verse 12, they did not tell them where. They only told them they would find a child wrapped in cloths or strips of cloth called swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Verse 16 tells us they came immediately and found the child just as the angel said. It doesn't say they followed a star. It doesn't say they stopped and asked for directions like the wise men. Could it be they knew exactly where to find the Christ child? Could it be Christ the Lamb of God was born where the lambs of sacrifice were born? You know, for centuries, lambs had to die for the sins of Israel. Inside the walls of the temple, two lambs would die every day. One mid-morning and one mid-afternoon. When a lamb died... A preach would blow a horn called the shofar. And everyone who heard it knew another lamb had to die for the sins of the people. The sacrifice was marked by blood. You see, the literal meaning of sacrifice is to slit the throat. Add to this the number the countless number of lambs sacrificed on major Jewish holidays. It happened year after year, generation after generation, century after century. 
Millions of lambs were sacrificed. Think of the Passover lamb used in the Jewish Passover feast. You know, it commemorated Israel's salvation as the death angel passed over the home in Egypt where the blood of the lamb was posted or sprinkled there over the doorpost. And for the Passover feast, every household in Israel was required to get a lamb. Most families did not have flocks of sheep, and so they depended upon the shepherds to bring their lambs into Jerusalem for them to purchase. But listen, in celebration of the Passover feast, they were required to take the lamb and live with the lamb in the house for four days. The children would name it. They would pet it. The family would feed it. And the family would smell it. And when the day of sacrifice came, the family would be broken and they would cry. They understood the cost of their sin. Paul referred to Jesus as the ultimate Passover lamb. He wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. John saw him. In the Revelation, John uses the Greek word arneon, which is translated 28 times in reference to Christ. It means little lamb. It is in reference to the sacrificial lamb. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb For our sins. What I want you to know today is this. The baby born in the stable in Bethlehem was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Where else would a lamb be born? Now there are several things that I could say about these shepherds today. But I've chosen to say three things by way of outline this morning. Number one, I want you to see that they wanted, they wanted the lamb. Look, if you will, at verses 15 and 16. You'll find in verse 15 the phrase, let us now go. The message translation says the shepherds said let us go and the translation says as fast as we can verse 16 says and they came with haste the niv version uses the word hurried the message again says they were running they wanted the lamb there was a an excited urgency. Now I want you to know that these shepherds were human. They had a free will. They had a choice to make. They could have responded in several different ways. They could have responded in were with indifference. I read about a school teacher, a high school teacher that got so frustrated One day, he he wrote on the board, A-P-A-T-H-Y. He underlined it twice and then put an exclamation point. And when he dotted the I or the exclamation point, he hit it so hard, so much force, he broke the marker. One student struggled to read what he had written. Unable to pronounce it, he just sort of tilted his head and spelled it out, trying to make out the word. And so he turned to his buddy and he asked, What is a pay thee? His buddy said, Who cares? 
the shepherds could have said concerning the invitation to the, to the manger. They could, have, they could have responded with apathy, with indifference. They also could have responded <clears throat> with indecision. Do you think it's true? If we go, what will the people think? If we go, what will the rabbis say? If we go, what will happen to the sheep? What will the child require of us? So many questions with no answers. Johnny was a little bit different. He was hired by the post office to sort mail. And at the end of the day, the supervisor said, Johnny, you did great. You're one of the fastest employees we've ever had. And Johnny replied, tomorrow I'm going to do better. His supervisor said, how can you do any better? Johnny said, tomorrow I'm going to read the labels. You see, choices can slow you down. They can complicate your life. They can confuse your routine. Perhaps these shepherds, you see, could have decided there's too many questions. I don't have time to get the answers and made no decision at all. They could have responded with indifference. They could have responded with indecision. But also, they could have responded with unbelief. This is how the religious leaders responded. They quoted Micah 5.2. The Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. But they did not believe it was happening. The shepherds could have decided it's not true. They could have said to themselves, it's happening or it can't happen but not tonight. And they could have stayed there around the fire Un, in unbelief. In unbelief. Excuse me just a moment. Let me get a little power. But the shepherds responded with energetic faith. And they found Christ. You see, they wanted Him. They wanted to know Him. They wanted to be with Him. They wanted to be in his presence. I read about a father that was sitting at his desk and he was working when his young son came into the room and he stood there beside his father and the father never looked up. He just reached in his pocket, got out a quarter, gave it to the boy and the boy said, Daddy, I don't want your money. The father just kept working, never looked up. In a minute, he reached in the candy dish, got a piece of candy out for his son, and his son said, Daddy, I don't want your candy. And in a minute, the father put his pen down and said, Well, son, what do you want? The son said, I just want to be with you. That's what these shepherds wanted. They wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to be with the Lamb of God. Let me ask you a question today. Do you want to be with Jesus? Do you want to spend time in His presence? Do you want to get to know Him? Do you want to hear His Word? Do you want to know His will? Corey Ten Boone, the Holy Cost uh, survivor, was so busy with her speaking engagements, she neglected her time with God. But there came a day when she hurt her leg, found herself in the hospital. And she said to God, Lord, I'm so busy. I can't afford just sitting around in the hospital. And the Lord spoke back to her and said, Yes, Corey. You are so busy, you haven't spent time with me, and I miss you. 
That's what these shepherds wanted. They wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to spend time with the Lamb of God. I hope you do too. And friend, if we don't, if we don't, Jesus will say to you and me, I've missed you. I've missed you. These shepherds wanted the Lamb. Number two. They witnessed of the Lamb. They witnessed of the Lamb. Look at verse 17. Now when they had seen Him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. They spoke all of what the angels said. Verse 18 tells us they all, or tells us that all that they heard They marveled at it. There was a state of excited wonder. Verse 19, Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. They were a witness to the Lamb. Folks, Jesus has always sought a witness. He called 12 men to follow him. You remember what he told them? If you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus told his disciples on the day of his ascension, go into all the world and make disciples. He also told them, he also told them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be my witnesses. He's always has, has had a witness. Will you be one? Dr. Bailey Smith has gone on to be with the Lord. Once told this story, there was in a community a church that was about to have an old-fashioned brush arbor meeting. And on the first night, they gathered together for that meeting. And there was one in the group who had special needs. And the community affectionately called him Dummy. And they all wondered when Dummy was going to get saved. On the first night, Dummy went forward. And they all wondered, how's he going to tell the preacher he wants to get saved? Because see, Dummy couldn't speak. All he could do was make guttural sounds. And as he came forward, he pointed to the Bible there on the platform or the table. Then he pointed toward God, and then he pointed to his heart. And the preacher knew that Dummy wanted to be saved, and the best that could be done, Dummy received the Lord. And each night of that meeting, Dummy would go up to people during the invitation time, and he would go, uh, and he would point to their hearts and say, uh, And then down the aisle, he would point. Ah, They knew. Dummy wanted them to be saved. And many were. Some months later, in a fashionable Southern Baptist church, a couple stood to give testimony. They said they were out for a drive one day, and they came up upon an intersection, and the traffic was backed up, and they thought to themselves, there must be a bad accident there. And so they got out of their parked car, walked up to the intersection, and this is what they said as they testified, we will never forget what Dummy had done. He'd gone up in the woods, and he brought down a large pine timber, and he placed it in the crossroads horizontally. He went back up into the forest or the the woods and got another large pine timber and came and and put it across that horizontal, made a vertical uh, pole. It made a cross right there in that intersection. And as people got out of their cars to come and talk to him, he would point toward God and say, Ah! He would point at their hearts and say, Ah! And that couple said, we watched as person after person knelt down by those old timbers and gave their heart 
hearts to Jesus. I submit to you, church, if dummy can do it, we can do it. The shepherds not only wanted Jesus, but they witnessed of the Lamb. They made widely known what they had seen and what they had heard. They witnessed of the Lamb. Now thirdly and finally, not only did they want the Lamb, not only were they witnesses of the Lamb, but listen, they worshipped the Lamb. Verse 20, then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. The words glorifying and praising are acts of continuous worship. Notice, they did not worship Mary. They did not worship Joseph. They worshiped God. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. Oh, friend, listen, they recognized they were in the presence of deity. Do you remember the story of Moses and how God called him to go into Egypt and demand the release of his people? And Moses asked God, well, who do I say sent me? When they ask me in that pluralistic society, what God has sent me, what shall I say? God said, tell them the I am sent you. Friend, that's his name. Jesus is his earthly name. But his heavenly name, his eternal name is the I am. Am. Mark Lowry had written the words of the song, Mary, Did You Know, way back in 1984, as part of the script for a Christmas play. I love this phrase. Did you know that your baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb? And the sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. The shepherds recognized they were in the presence of the great I am. And he was worthy of the glory and worthy of the honor and worthy of the praise. They worshiped the lamb. Matt Redman wrote a song entitled, It's All About You, Jesus. And he says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's it's all about you, Jesus. Would you consider that word heart for a moment? Would you consider an acrostic of the word heart? You see, I really believe that we as Christians today, need to get back to the heart of worship. The H stands for humility. Folks, pride is, the most, is most often the greatest hindrance to worship. Pride will cause us to consume our time and be consumed with thoughts about ourselves. We can come to church and sit down and start thinking, am I comfortable? Do I look good to those who are around me? Is everything up to my standards? Did I get my way? Folks, if we hope to get back to the heart of worship, we've got to enter into God's presence with humility. The pastor told the large congregation all about Hudson Taylor, the pioneer missionary, and all he'd accomplished in China. And then he presented him with these words, our illustrious guest. Taylor stood quietly for a moment and then opened the message by saying, Dear friends, I am the little servant of the illustrious master. 
to get back to the heart of worship, friend, we must become the little eye. And God must become the big eye. Humility. E stands for eagerness. Do you anticipate worship? Do you worship with an eager heart? A heart that surrenders everything to the Savior. A heart that is eager to worship God every day. A heart that is worshiped to get or eager to worship with the saints on the Lord's day. Are you eager to, to worship? The Bible calls it hungering and thirsting. Are we eager to worship? The A stands for adoration. We've sung this Christmas season, Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. You know what an adoration means? Adoration is the deep love and respect given to God. You see, the shepherds, when they came, they not only bowed the knee, but they also just loved Jesus. They just loved the Lamb. Oh, how we need to come together and worship and just love Him. Respect Him. Respect and love the Lord Jesus. Adore Him. The R stands for repentance. Folks, Christ came for all sinners. The unrighteous as well as the self-righteous. And how sad it is that the self-righteous Often very religious folks need forgiveness as much as the unrighteous. They just don't think so. We cannot offer true worship until we first acknowledge our sin. The T stands for thanksgiving. Folks, can we ever be thankful enough? For all that Christ has done for us. One time Matthew Henry. You might recognize that name. He wrote a series of commentaries. He was attacked by a robber. All his money was gone. It would have been understandable if he'd been angry. But here's what he wrote in his diary. Let me be thankful. First. I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my purse, they didn't take my life. And third, although they took my all, it wasn't much. And fourth, let me be thankful because it was I who was robbed and not I who was doing the robbing. Folks, listen to me. We have so much to be thankful for. And thankfulness is more than a once a year emphasis. You cannot worship without thankfulness. Let's get back to the heart of worship. Humility. Eagerness. Adoration. Repentance. Thanksgiving. Now, friend, to get back to the heart of worship, we've got to meet with Jesus every day in worship. We often associate worship with a place. Tony Evans once once stated, if you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave that place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up old bulletin. Worship is the attitude of the heart. You can worship in a cathedral or you can worship in a cave like the shepherds. You can worship in your car. You can worship in your home. You can worship at your work. You can worship in your play. It is a grateful attitude that thinks of God and loves God and gives God the glory. We are to worship Him every day. But also, we ought to worship him with the saints in corporate worship. Did you know many of our Christian kids and young people have a drug problem? 
Yeah. They get drugged to church every Sunday. Yeah. Some of you remember those days. I've been asked, preacher, how can I get my child out of bed? How can I get my young person out of bed? How can I get them to want to come to church? Well, I guess there's a lot of variables. But I can tell you this. You've got to teach them to want to come. You've got to teach them about the value of learning and discipleship and worship. You've got to teach them about forgetting themselves and focusing on God. Say, preacher, how do I teach that? With your mouth and with your actions. They've got to see your eagerness for Sunday. They've got to see your anticipation together with the saints. I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for that time because I know God is going to be there and he's going to do something great in my heart. When was the last time you told your children that? Or you told your grandchildren that? Oh, friend, we've got to teach it. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Someone has suggested that we should consider these things when we gather for worship. Listen to them. Draw near and listen well because God is communicating. Be quiet and stay calm because God hears the inaudible and he sees the invisible. Make a commitment and keep it because God does not forget. Don't decide now and deny later because God doesn't ignore decisions. The shepherds left their flocks and came to the manger That first Christmas, the Lamb, the Lamb of God had been born. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world had been born, and they wanted him, and they witnessed of him, and they worshiped him. That should be our response this Christmas. I read about a woman that was in line to pay at the shopping center at Christmas time, and she had been standing there for 30 minutes. Parents were arguing. Kids were bickering and fighting. And this lady turned to the next one in line and said, Joy to the world. You've been there, haven't you? Folks, there is more for the Christian at Christmas time than just the hustle and bustle of Christmas. It can be real. It can be meaningful. It can be life-changing if we do what the shepherds did with the lamb on that first Christmas. If we want him, if we witness of him, and if we worship him, Christmas can change our lives.